Good morning. Today we're going to talk about cell membrane. We've been talking about the cell membrane when you talked about organelles and how organelle structures impact function. And today we're going to go into way more detail so that you have a deeper understanding how the structure impacts its function. So cell membrane structure and function, how the cell security system works. The standard for today, students will analyze the nature of relationships between structures and functions in living cells. Now notice I have a couple of words highlighted in yellow because they are great importance in making sure you understand what the standard is about. So if you notice, the word analyze is highlighted. That's the first thing on your guided notes that you need to fill in. Analyze is what we do a lot in science. We are able to bring a lot of information, a lot of data together and draw conclusions from that information. So when we analyze something, we're taking all the information about whatever we're looking at and draw some type of conclusion. Also, notice that the word relationship is highlighted. Relationship just means there is a connection between two concepts. There's a bridge. They are somehow going to connect to each other. So the concepts that we're going to be looking at today are structure and function, and how those two concepts have a relationship, how they are connected. So go ahead and fill that in on your guided notes as well. The term structure, another key term in your standard. Structure is just how something is made how something is made. Function is how something works. So we are going to look at today how something is made is connected to how it works. Now if you notice our element for today says explain the role of cell organelles for both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells including the cell membrane in maintaining homostasis and cell reproduction. Now I have highlighted those words but they're in a different color. They're in a different color because these are terms that you have been exposed to already in previous units that we've covered. But we're just going to quickly go back over them to make sure you guys remember what those terms mean. Organelles. If you look up here on my anchor chart, an organelle is nothing but a structure, there's that key word again, structure, found in cells that perform a specific function. So an organelle is nothing but how it's made and it's actually going to perform a specific job. Prokaryotic. Prokaryotic are types of cells that have no membrane-bound organelles. That's going to be important, especially once you understand how the membrane is made and how it's impactful in how the cell actually works. And then lastly, eukaryotes are cells that have a membrane-bound organelles. They have membrane-bound organelles. So those are some terms that we've already covered. Now, the cell membrane is the star of the show today. We're going to talk about that a lot today. And then homostasis is a term that, yes, you've covered already, but we're going to revisit that in today's presentation. Learning targets. What is my expectation of you to be able to know and understand by the time you walk out of the classroom today? You will be able to explain how the structure of a phospholipid is related to the function for the cell membrane. Once again, you will be able to explain, that's the key term there, explain, how the structure of a phospholipid is related to its function for the cell membrane. The other learning target that I'm going to expect you to be able to do by the end of today's lesson is that you will be able to apply your understanding of the role phospholipids play in allowing molecules to cross the membrane. So you have to apply what you're learning today. So it's not going to just be spitting back out facts to me. You're going to have to actually understand enough where you can apply it to whatever scenario I give, it to, give to you. Assessment. You will be assessed based on your ability to complete two real world scenario questions that applies your understanding of the role phospholipids play in allowing molecules to cross the membrane. So we're going to do some hands on activities today. But at the end of that, you will have to actually answer two questions that's going to apply your understanding. Vocabulary. So the vocabulary that we're covering. We've already covered some of the previously taught vocabulary, which include homostasis, eukaryote, prokaryote, and organelle. And we actually already talked about structure and function. But two words that we did not talk about that you're going to see in today's lesson are barrier and regulate. Now, tier two terms are terms that you may see in other classes, but they may or may not mean the same thing. So for example, barrier, you may have heard about trade barriers before in social studies. 
Well, in here, we're going to talk about how a barrier actually functions as well in stopping or possibly stopping certain molecules from crossing the membrane. And then regulates means it actually controls. It's choosy. It's picky about what can cross the membrane. Tier 3 vocab is the vocab that's very special to this class and this lesson for today. So cell membrane, you're going to learn about phospholipid, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, polar, and nonpolar. Very important terms, probably brand new to you. So we're going to spend a lot of time making sure you understand what they mean and how they play a role in the cell membrane. So I have a couple of items up here. And I want you guys to help me out as we talk about their structure and their function. Anybody recognize this particular item? Air filter. And the key word there, you actually said filter. So when we usually filter something, that usually means we only want certain things to be able to cross or come through and not everything. So our air filter is really good in making sure that it filters out the bad stuff, meaning it blocks the things that we don't want to breathe in so that we can breathe in the good stuff. Now, what could be some examples of some bad things? Dust. dust, especially if you have allergies, right? We don't want to breathe in dust if you have allergies. Germs, so anything like viruses, bacteria. So those are things that we definitely want to make sure that they're not able to pass through. Now, how the filter works is based on the structure of this filter. And if you look at it very closely, I'm going to pass it around in a second, you'll see that there's very small little holes. And those small little holes allows the good th stuff to get through. And if it's not small enough, it will not be able to what? Pass through. OK? So that's one example. Another example, everyone should have one of these at their table. They're probably going to become obsolete in a couple of years because of the QREG system. But anybody recognize this? A coffee filter. Keyword again, filter. So once again, it's very selective. It's choosy. It regulates. There's that key word again, regulates. What can cross? And what determines if it can cross or not is the size. So once again, if you ever want to look at the filter that you have at your table, do you, you guys see the little <coughs> small holes that are there? Yes. OK? So size, once again, determines if it can filter through. So we get the coffee grinds will not go through. And the coffee that we actually want to drink with the water can pass through. OK? So did it stop everything? No. It was very selective. OK? It was regulating. So it allowed certain things to pass. It was a selective barrier. Let's look at these two items. Anybody recognize these two items? Strainers. Strainers. Good. And what do we use strainers for in our household? Cooking. So normally if I'm trying to, once again, remove something but don't want to remove everything, I can use these two items. It's very selective. And once again, if you look very closely, you see small openings. So size determines what can go through and what we can keep. So I usually can use this to filter out my spaghetti. Maybe I want to keep the spaghetti, right? But we don't want all the fat and the water to stay, so we can use this to drain. Or if I'm cooking something with grease and I just want to scoop out the fries and leave the grease behind, once again, the grease would go through, but the fries would remain. Once again, this works as a selective barrier. OK? So with that in mind, the membrane of a cell has two main roles. OK? So let's go ahead and fill this in on our guided notes. The membrane of a cell has two main roles. It is a physical barrier. And remember, we just talked about barriers. Barriers mean they stop things from crossing or passing through. And it regulates exchange of materials with its surroundings. Regulate. It controls what can cross the barrier. It controls what can cross the barrier. So a cell membrane, it's fair to say that it's like an air filter, it's like a coffee filter, and it's like a strainer. OK, so it's, like, it's a simile that we just did. So, using your um, student response systems, I want you guys to answer this question. What is the primary function of the cell membrane? A, to act as a selective barrier, or B, to act as a complete barrier?
try that again. To act as a selective barrier or to act as a complete barrier. Go ahead and select your response. Very good, to act as a selective barrier. So keep in mind that the cell membrane doesn't completely stop everything. It does allow some things to cross the membrane. So it's very selective. It is picky, it's cheesy. Okay. So why do we care about how the cell membrane works? Why is it significant? Why is it important that we understand how it operates, how it functions? All living cells must be able to exchange materials nutrients and waste with their external environments in order to remain alive. So if the cell cannot get the bad stuff out and the good stuff in, the cell will eventually die. So it's very important that the cell membrane is functioning because the cell membrane is what determines what can exit and enter the cell. In order to do those things, the cell is trying to maintain homostasis. Homostasis, if you guys remember back at the beginning of the semester, you learned that homostasis means it's how the body is able to regulate and keep things balanced. So if I was to go outside and go running, my body would naturally begin to sweat in order to make sure that my temperature does not get too hot. Or if it's really cold outside, my body will naturally what? Shiver in order to make sure I stay warm, okay? So that's maintaining homostasis on a big scale. On a small scale, if you look at the cell, it's, or it's able to maintain homostasis with the cell membrane. It determines what can enter and leave the cell so that the cell can continue to function. So it keeps things balanced. It regulates that process. So make sure you fill that in on your guided notes. So real world significance. We all agree that our body needs oxygen in order to survive. Do we agree with that? Are we all breathing oxygen right now? Yeah. Hopefully, okay. So it's very important that oxygen can enter the cell. It is also equally important that what we breathe out, which is carbon dioxide, is able to exit the cell. Because if it doesn't, it becomes very toxic to the cell and eventually you would die, okay. So that's an example of why it's important that the cell membrane is functioning correctly. All right, so let's talk about the structure of the membrane. The structure of the membrane, because remember, we have to understand how the structure is related to its function. So in order to do that, we first have to understand the structure. Phospholipids are the basic structure of the cell membrane. And the phospholipid has two different locations. It has a head and it has a tail. So I want you guys right now, using your chalk on your desk, I want you to draw a circle, and we're going to label that circle as the head of a phospholipid. So everyone go ahead and draw that circle and label it as the head of the phospholipid. This phospholipid also has two I call them legs pretty much, but we also call them tails. So let's go ahead and draw the tails of the phospholipid as well. And let's label that as tail. All right. So that's the overall general structure of a phospholipid. Now, we're going to learn in detail about each part of the phospholipid and the role it plays in the function of the cell membrane. We have some prefixes and suffixes that we're going to review very quickly. Hydro, when you hear that word, immediately what comes to mind, hopefully, is the word water. Okay? So hydro means water. Philic, that word may not be as familiar for you, but I'm going to tell you that philic means to love or loving. So hydrophilic, when I put those two terms together, means water loving. So let's label the head because the head is hydrophilic, meaning it loves water.
okay? It loves water. So since it loves water, let's put a smiley face in there because it's very happy. Usually if you love something, you want to be attracted to it. You want to be as close to it as possible. Now, another term that we're going to learn is hydro. There's that key word again, hydro. Hydro means what again? Water. Water. Hydrophobic. Now, when I hear the word phobic, I immediately think of the word phobia. And if someone normally has a phobia of something, they're usually very, very afraid or scared of and want to be as far away from it as possible. So hydrophobic means water fearing. Water fearing. So the tails of your phospholipid is hydrophobic. So let's go ahead and label our tails as hydrophobic. Meaning they don't like water. They want to be as far away from water as possible. Are they attracted to water? No. No, there is no attraction. They want to get as far away, put as much distance between them and water as they possibly can. So on your drawing that you just drew, go ahead and put water near the head because that's where water likes to be. It likes to be close to the head of the phospholipid, as far away from the tails as it possibly can be. Another term that we're going to learn is polar. Now, we just got through talking about hydrophilic means it's attracted to water. Well, if something is polar, there's usually a charge. And if something has a charge to it, there's usually an attraction. So when you think about magnets, magnets have charges and they're drawn to each other, right? Okay? So if something is polar, it has a slight charge to it, so it's drawn to something that's also like itself. It wants to be as close to it as possible. Does that make sense to everyone? So the head of a phospholipid is polar. So let's go ahead and label the head as polar. Now I just told you that the head is polar. It's very attracted to water. So it's fair to say that water is also what? Polar. Because they're attracted to each other. They want to be as close to each other as possible. Now, molecules that do not have a charge. There's no charge. So if there's no charge, there is no attraction. So the tail is nonpolar. Nonpolar. So let's go ahead and label our tails in our drawing as nonpolar. There is no attraction because there is no charge. So is it drawn to water in any kind of way? No. no. Is it drawn to anything that's polar? No, because there is no attraction. So whenever you hear the word hydrophilic, you should immediately think the word polar. And whenever you hear the word hydrophobic, you should immediately think the word nonpolar. Those two words go hand in hand. So let's go ahead and answer this question using your student response system. Let's see if we're all on the same page, okay? The best way to describe the head of a phospholipid, the head of a phospholipid, and if you need to look back at your drawing, or my drawing, that's fine, is that it's nonpolar and hydrophilic, Polar and hydrophobic, polar and hydrophilic, nonpolar and hydrophobic. Think back to what two words I say always go together and use your drawing if you can't quite remember to help you answer the question. So let's see if we're all on the same page. <coughs> so the head of a phospholipid is polar and hydrophilic. And everyone got it correct. Excellent job. So your drawing, just to make sure we're all on the same page, your drawing in your notes should reflect this. 
phospholipid structure, hydrophilic head, polar head, hydrophobic tail, nonpolar tail. Okay, so very quickly, let's make sure that we understand the structure of a phospholipid. I'm going to give you all the opportunity to participate in a virtual activity. And you are going to select the correct answer. So Shelly, raise your hand Shelly. Shelly, now that you have reviewed the structure of a cell membrane, we've talked about it, I want you to identify the phospholipid structure. So select the word phospholipid and drag it to the correct term, I'm sorry, correct structure that reflects a phospholipid structure. Excellent, excellent. Okay, I want you to now click on the part that forms the basic structure. Okay, click on the part that forms the basic frame of the cell membrane. Now, you don't have to wait before you answer. Talk amongst your group to make sure you guys are all on the same page. Okay, and come to a consensus that you all agree with. What is the correct structure that is the basic frame of the cell membrane? Excellent, excellent. Okay, Calicia, I want you, after you're talking with your group members, I want you to identify the hydrophilic head. The hydrophilic heads. We'll talk with your group members first to make sure you're all on the same page. Excellent, excellent. And then lastly, I want you to select the hydrophobic tails after you talk with your group member. Excellent. So, hopefully, based on this, seems like everyone's very comfortable with the structure of the phospholipid. All right, so one thing that we need to understand, and we kind of touched on it a little bit already. In chemistry, we have a saying that like dissolves like. So that basically means if it's polar, then it should dissolve in things that are polar. If it's nonpolar, then it will dissolve in things that are nonpolar. And if it's polar, it will not dissolve in anything that's nonpolar. Okay? So that's the term that you always want to think about when we talk about will it dissolve. Like dissolves like. So what do I mean by that? Well, here's water. We established earlier that water is polar. polar. I have a substance here. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but let's determine if it's polar or not. And how will we be able to determine if it's polar or not? It will dissolve. Give it a little mixture here. Did I get a color change in my liquid? Yes. So do we have any separation out taking place? No. no. So whatever it was that I poured in here is actually polar. Okay? Now, here's another example. Notice that I have something in this bottle. Anybody recognize this? Salad dressing, okay? Specifically, it's balsamic vinaigrette. Anything weird happening in this bottle? It separates out. It separates out. Even if I shake it up, eventually what's going to happen is that it's going to, once again, separate back out. And the reason is because, let's go back to the rules up here. The rule says like dissolves like. So if it's not dissolving, then that means one thing in here is polar and the other thing in here is nonpolar, okay? So whenever you get two separation of layers like that, you immediately know that you have two things that are not alike in the bottle. Any questions? Okay. So characteristics for determining if something could cross the membrane. One characteristic is the size of the molecule. 
the size of the molecule. So whether it's large or small, okay? So that determines if it can cross the membrane. The other characteristic is if it has a charge or not, meaning if it's polar or if it is nonpolar, okay? And we've already determined how we can figure that out. So let's talk about how can we determine the size of a molecule. So I have an example up here, H2O, which we all know to be the chemical formula for water, water okay? So when I look at the structure up here, I notice that hydrogen, which is represented by the letter H, has a two next to it. That tells me I have two molecules of hydrogen. So I write the number two here. Notice that there is no number here next to the O, and that's because in science we understand that there's no need to write it because there's only one. So this particular molecule of water is made up of a total of three atoms. We consider that in science to be a very small molecule. Okay? Now, let's look at this structure. We have C6H12O6. Notice that once again next to the carbon, I have the number six. So that tells me I have six atoms of carbon. Next to the hydrogen, I have the number 12. So that tells me I have 12 atoms of hydrogen. And next to the oxygen, I have a number six. So I have six atoms of oxygen. When I add those numbers up, that gives me the number 24 atoms. We consider that to be a very large molecule. So in science, we always use water as our reference point to determine if it's large or small, depending on if it can cross the membrane or not. So if it's close to around the number three, we consider it to be small. So it could be a number two, it could be a four or five, we consider that to be a small molecule. But if you start getting around the numbers 12 and 15 and 24, we're considering that to be a pretty large molecule, okay? So, I want you guys on your paper now to do this particular one, and we'll do it together. We have NH4. So next to NH4, how many atoms do I have? Remember, there's no number there, so we understand that to be what? One. one. Very good. Next to hydrogen, I have? Three. Three. So my total number is? Four. four. I don't want you to tell me yet if it's large or small. I want you to think about it. Is the molecule NH3 considered to be a large or small molecule? Now before you answer, I want you to think back to when we thought about the water molecule. Water molecule had how many atoms? Three. And I told you if it's close to the number around water, then we would classify it the same as water. So apply your knowledge here and go ahead and select your answer. Let's see what the class consensus is. Small, and everyone is correct. It is a small molecule because it's close to the size of water. Okay? Now, we still got to apply our knowledge again. Can NH3 cross the cell membrane easily? Can NH3, before you answer, before you answer, I want you to think about it because we're going to apply our knowledge. We know that water can cross the membrane easily because it is small. So the question is, since it's small, just like water, can NH3 cross the membrane easily? So let's apply our knowledge and go ahead and select your answer. And everyone said yes. Excellent job. Yes, NH3 will be able to cross the membrane easily because it is small. So, types of molecules that can cross the membrane easily. Small. It doesn't matter if they're polar or not, as long as they are small, they can cross the membrane. Nonpolar. If they are nonpolar, they can be large or small. They can cross the membrane. And then hydrophobic. Hydrophobic, remember, we put that together with the word nonpolar. So once again, 
it doesn't matter the size because they can cross the membrane. Now, a good question is, why? Why can they cross the membrane? Well, notice here, on this picture, I have a hydrophobic molecule. Remember, hydrophobic means they have no attraction. There is no charge. They're not attracted to anything that is what? Polar. Is, does everybody remember me talking about that? Yeah. So since there is no attraction, when they get to something that is polar, they're not going to be drawn to it. They're not going to stick to it. They're just going to go ahead and move right by it. Okay. When they come into contact with their nonpolar tails that's just like them, once again, there is no what? Attraction because there is no charge and they can keep moving through the membrane. But if you look at a polar molecule that's large, there is a attraction and they basically get stuck to the phospholipid head and they can't pass through the membrane. They're bonded to the membrane at that point. If they are small, think of it like a spider in a crack in a wall. It's able to get through because it's small enough to pass through without getting stuck. Okay? So, let's sum all that up to make sure we're all on the same page. If the substance is polar, and make sure you fill this in into your guided notes, if the substance is polar, hydrophilic, and small, it will be able to cross the membrane. So as long as it's small, it could be polar and hydrophilic. If the substance is nonpolar, hydrophobic, it can also cross the membrane. But if the substance is polar, hydrophilic, and large, it cannot cross the membrane. It cannot cross the membrane. So let's revisit our learning targets and see if we're all on the same page. First, I want you to be able to explain how the structure of the phospholipid is related to its function for the cell membrane. Second, I want you to be able to apply your understanding of the role phospholipids play in allowing molecules to cross the membrane. So those are two things that I want you to be able to do by the end of class today. So now we're going to do some guided practice work to make sure that we're all on the same page and have a good understanding. So we're going to do, become some forensic investigators for the plasma membrane. You have been hired to determine what material was able to breach security and cross the membrane. There are certain characteristics you will test your suspects for to determine if they are guilty or not. Before you get started, three culprits have already come forward and have been questioned. Their answers to the question will help you to determine if they are guilty or not of crossing the membrane. So let's do the first one together. Notice that it says molecule oxygen, O2, the dissolving solution is water. Remember, water is polar. So if you look here, it tells me that oxygen did not dissolve. Did not dissolve. So what does that tell me now? I should think back to what we talked about earlier if it does not dissolve, like dissolves like. So oxygen, obviously, is nonpolar because it did not dissolve in something that is polar. So everyone, go ahead and write here, nonpolar. <coughs> also remember, I told you earlier, when you think of the word nonpolar, the word that should immediately come to mind should be hydrophobic because they go hand in hand. So let's go ahead and write the word hydrophobic in the next box. Now, since it's nonpolar and hydrophobic, if you remember earlier, I told you size didn't matter if it's nonpolar and hydrophobic. But let's go ahead and figure out the size anyway, just to make sure we know how to do that. So how many oxygen atoms do I have here based on this number next to the O? Two. two. So two is close to the same number as water, because water, if you remember, has three atoms. So we would consider oxygen to be a small molecule. So let's go ahead and write the word small into the box. And now the big question. Is he guilty of crossing the membrane? And the answer would be yes. 
because he is nonpolar and hydrophobic. So he doesn't get stuck to that polar head. Okay, so I want you all to do the next one and then we'll talk about it together. And you can work with your groups to figure it out. You can talk it out. I want to hear some conversation. So, um, the outside, um, um, yeah. Talk through it like I was talking through it. If you have to look back at your notes, it's fine. Make sure you're on the same page as your team members at your table. You're all in agreement. <coughs> and let's go over it. All right, so carbon dioxide, CO2. My dissolving solution is still going to be water. It tells you it did not dissolve. It did not dissolve. So what does that tell me about CO2? Um, Calicia. Why don't your table tell me that one? That is non-polar. Because if you think back, we know that like dissolves what? Like. And so since it did not dissolve, obviously it's not like water. So that tells me that it is non-polar. Because we know it's non-polar, immediately I should think of what word? Hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. So we can go ahead and write that word in. And then molecular size, let's look, let's figure it out. Size doesn't really matter? No, but let's still make sure we know how to do it. So we have CO2, carbon doesn't have a number next to it, so that tells me immediately that has how many carbons? One. One. And then oxygen has a two next to it, that tells me I have how many? Two. two. So two plus one equals three. three. So is that a large or small molecule in reference to water? Small. small. So let's go ahead and write the word small. And then will the molecule cross the membrane? Yes. yes. Okay. Last one. Glucose. Glucose still stay in dissolving solution, which is water. It tells me that it did dissolve. So think back. Light dissolves light. So tell me, is it polar or nonpolar? Polar. Polar, excellent. Okay. Hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hydrophilic. Hydrophilic, excellent. Because we know that when we think about the word hydrophilic, I should immediately think about the word polar. And then size. Let's look at the size. We did this one earlier. C6H12O6. So 6 plus 12 plus 6 equals 24. We consider that to be large or small? Large. large. So we have a large polar hydrophilic molecule. Will it cross the membrane? No. No. Excellent job. Excellent job. OK, so go ahead and color code your chart so that you understand <clears throat> that anything that you color red will be able to cross the membrane, and anything that you color blue will not be able to cross the membrane easily. We'll learn later how the things like glucose can cross the membrane. Because they still have to get in, they just cannot get in easily. They have to take a different pathway.
Okay, everybody's good? Everybody's ready to move forward? Okay, so now you're gonna work in your groups at your table, and you're gonna continue doing your investigation, but now that you have questioned the three suspects, you are now ready to test evidence left behind by the other possible suspects. You decided to run a simple test to determine if they are capable of crossing the membrane easily. You remember the phrase, like dissolves like, meaning that polar dissolves polar and nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. Remember, criteria for crossing the membrane easily, nonpolar and hydrophobic are the molecule is smaller than water. So you are going to run some tests today, and the items are on your table, and you are going to add your items to water. So water is our dissolving solution. So our dissolving solution is polar. And remember, if it dissolves in water, then that means the item is also polar. Polar, right? OK? So we're going to fill in our chart. And I'm going to give you guys about 15 minutes to run your test. And then we'll talk about it. Any questions before you begin? Go ahead and put your goggles on. And when you get ready to test your vitamins, you're going to use the little push pan that I have in there to poke a hole, and then you squeeze the liquid that's in the peel into your water solution. 15 minutes starting now. As you're mixing your items, you may have to get some agitation, so you have little stirs there. For the vegetable oil, dissolved in water, did not dissolve in water. Which one? Did not, okay? Which tells me it is nonpolar. I immediately think of the word hydrophobic, good. And the size of oil is pretty Large, but remember, does size matter if it's nonpolar and hydrophobic? No. no. So will it cross the membrane? Yes. yes. So you should color that one red. For your next one, sucrose, it actually did dissolve. So that tells me immediately that it is polar, which tells me again what word? Hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. And it is large, because size in this case does matter. And so will it cross the membrane? No. no. Very good. Vitamin E did not dissolve. So immediately I should think nonpolar, hydrophobic. And the size is large, but does it matter? No. Will it cross the membrane? Yes. yes. <coughs> Omega-3 did not dissolve. It is also Nonpolar, it is hydrophobic, very large. Will it cross the membrane? Yes. yes. And then lastly, ascorbic acid, which is also known as vitamin C, okay? It actually did dissolve, meaning that it is polar, also meaning what word? Hydrophilic. And it is a small or large molecule? Large. Large, will it cross the membrane? No. no. Very good. So let's revisit our learning targets. You will be able to explain how the structure of the phospholipid is related to the function of the cell membrane. And you will be able to apply your understanding, which is key, to the role phospholipids play in allowing molecules to cross the membrane. <coughs> So, I want you guys to tell me, and this is anonymous, can you explain how the structure, do you feel confident enough to go home and tell your mom or dad or little sister how the structure of a phospholipid is related to its function for the cell membrane? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Or do you, are you just neutral? Okay, so go ahead and select your response. If I get any disagrees, we'll, we'll revisit some things. 
Okay. Well, at least I didn't get any disagrees. Okay, so most of you guys agree that you feel pretty comfortable with explaining the structure. And about 31% of you guys are kind of ambivalent about it, meaning you don't feel one way or the other, but at least no one in here said they strongly disagree. Okay? So let's do the next one. I can apply my understanding of the role phospholipids play in allowing molecules to cross the membrane. I can apply my understanding. Do we agree? Do we disagree? Are we neutral? Excellent. 100% say they agree. So I, I actually love that everyone feels they can apply their understanding. Okay, now, <clears throat> based on that, now you guys are going to go into Edmodo. I've posted a quiz. You can work together on this. You can work together on this, okay? And I want you to talk it out. I want to hear the conversations you're having as you're trying to answer the two questions. Because this is showing me you can apply your understanding. But you need to talk about it to make sure everyone understands and is on the same page. So the first question reads, pesticides are toxins used to kill organisms. When scientists design pesticides, they must keep in mind that the toxin must be able to cross the membrane easily. Based upon your understanding of the characteristics molecules need to pass easily across the cell membrane, describe, describe what characteristics pesticides must have in order to be used to kill organisms. And explain to me why. Why must they have those characteristics? OK? That's the first question. <clears throat> the second question on your quiz says, recently, there is concern regarding how pesticides may disrupt the female reproductive function. Using your same understanding of how pesticides work to kill organisms, why should there be any concern regarding pesticide exposure to humans? To humans, okay? So go ahead and work with your groups to answer those two questions in Edmodo and then submit, okay? <clears throat> Remember, I want to hear the conversations. I want to hear how you're thinking out the answer to the question. Okay, so let's go over the answers. The first question, really you have to make sure that there's really two answers, or if you gave both answers, it was fine. So the characteristics you could have said that it was polar, but it had to be small, okay? So if you said polar and small as a characteristic, that was acceptable. You also could have said that it had to be nonpolar, and it didn't matter if it was a small or large molecule. So if you said nonpolar and hydrophobic, you were correct. If you said polar, hydrophilic, and small, you were correct. Now, to explain why it has to have those characteristics is because if you think back, we talked about the attraction, and I went over how the polar molecules would be attracted to the phospholipid head and get stuck. They wouldn't cross the membrane. But if they're small enough, then they would be able to bypass getting stuck to the phospholipid head. If they are nonpolar and hydrophobic, there is no attraction. So they're able to go through the membrane easily. So you have to support your answer of the characteristics with the why, okay? For the second question, one thing I wanted you to realize, because if you think back to our standard, we talked about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, you have to realize that we are eukaryotes just like pesticides. So if it goes through the membrane of a pesticide, I mean through a pest, an organism like an ant or a spider or some type of bug, it will also be able to go through our membrane. And so we should be very concerned because if it's toxic to them, it's definitely also going to be toxic to us. And so that means it can cross our membrane as well and toxins can build up inside of our cells. So that's why when you're handling pesticides, they always have to let you know the pesticides have been sprayed around you and you don't want to breathe them in, okay? So those were the two answers I was looking for. Does everyone feel that they gave me something in that range in their answers? Okay, excellent, excellent. 
All right, so that is our lesson for today. <coughs> Any questions before you leave for your next class? Excellent. Thank you guys for today.